All right. <clears throat> awesome. John, my name's Russ Grease. Real pleasure. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Where am I? Here in Mississippi Beach, Oregon. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And this place is an electronics lab, as we call it here. I like it. It's cool. It's got some vintage uh, naval test equipment. Actually, this came from the University of British Columbia. 97. Yeah, 50 bucks for the two. 50, 50 bucks. So can I turn this? Yeah. Oh yeah. And frequency generator? Uh spectrum analyzer. Oh that's a spectrum analyzer? Yeah. Really? So if I'm listening to static, I can listen to see also the signals on the scope up here. Listen to static? Yeah. How do you listen to static? A lot of noise that comes from out there somewhere. Which means there's got to be a source for it to be generated and to come to me. Well, who's generating it? Man-made, or it can be natural. What's a natural frequency sound like? Oh, they're usually... Okay, natural can be in high band, um, like hydrogen band, actually most of the bands. Static patterns, static... Actually, um... It's interesting on that because we built a... Detector, known as a field stress detector for detection of oil, gas, and minerals a long time ago. How's that work? It, well, it's actually a little diode, and I had one. Okay. A little diode that um, gravity waves affected along with um, electromagnetics. And we found that uh, we walked out of this thing. Okay. With ordinary volt ohmmeter, that we could pick up weird different types of um, energy that would register on the meter. Voltage? Yeah, actual voltage. And the sound and other effects were then quite impressive. We used it to detect if there was going to be an event with the Hutchison effect. Okay. So you, so what did you, so you could put it in the space and you could actually see where the strongest field point was? Oh yeah, yeah, it starts to vibrate back and forth in reverse polarity. Really? Yeah, and it was pretty cool. And we could determine when the effects were going to happen. Now, if we would also not bother with the effects, we'd take it outside and walk around buildings in different areas in Vancouver, and it would get these different weird readings, like a corner of a building. It would give us a reading. So the time we moved on to that thing, um, I had two business partners, one, and we were funded by Boeing Aerospace Corporation. Big fights developed, long story, a lot of lawyers, <laughs> a lot of papers. I was with a, a lady at the time, uh, Yin, she arranged for the lawyers, <clears throat> and actually we were planning to move to Germany all on lab and everything to go there, which had never made it. But anyway, this field destructor later on became a detector for oil, gas, and minerals. So is it something that you created? Or is it just a diode? It's just a special military diode that had these unusual characteristics. Do you remember the number on it? I didn't. Yeah. I have one here that I can... I have a CR... No, I'm, I we could find it. Yeah. We'll find it later. Okay. <laughs> so when you so I heard a story. Nancy was telling me a story when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. You used to listen to static. Yep. Can you go through that? Oh yeah, my dad had a gigantic old um, vacuum tube receiver. It fascinated me because what well, is these weird static sounds and static? They've got to be a source. For In between the stations. Yeah. You would tune into the static. Yeah. And what did you hear? I heard what I think was um, hydroelectric plants running. You can hear the phase. The emissions from them? Uh, the coils in that were giving off these phase, like half a, like 30 cycles per second and stuff like that. Okay. So you could actually detect those phases. You could hear. I can hear it. You can visualize it. And I go, you could visualize it. Yeah, I use visualization a lot. Okay, so what would you visualize when you were seeing these? I visualize gigantic motors running somewhere. 
okay. hydroelectric plant. Okay. <laughs> and there was a lot of other things that later on I knew that were, excuse <coughs> me, probably meteorites come in. You could hear them whistlers and bangers and that kind of thing. And there was the, also the, as the day moved on and tonight, the uh, ionosphere would change and be all kinds of crazy, wild, and <coughs> wonderful so, signals come in. So you could hear, you could, you could actually, it's, you, so if you would hear a signal, would you would just visualize what you were hearing? Yeah, and could see what it possibly could be. Okay. And later confirmations made by ham radio operators. Yeah. Because I hung around a lot with a lot of old timers that were in ham radio or engineering or machinery. The old guys would tell me a lot of stuff. So, so how how old were you when you were a kid listening to Static? I would probably say six, seven, or eight. And what year was that? Okay, I don't want to go there. <laughs> you don't have to say. A that. long time ago. Let's see if we're young. That's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I made the life extension. I don't want to into programmable age for everything. So. Perfect. No big deal. Oh. Yeah. So you so you started out listening to Static, and where did that take you? What did you do after after you were hearing these and visualizing these things? What did you do? Did you get some equipment? What was the first thing that you had that you were playing with besides that radio? Oh, good grief! Uh, yeah, uh, I started making hydrogen. Okay. And I made a spark gap transfer. So how did you make your hydrogen? Um, just simple line aluminum, aluminum as the Brits call it. Okay. So what would you do? You would take aluminum and... Yeah, I'd get that, roll it up, put in a, a gallon jug, pour in onto the water lye. Yep. And get all this heat generated and put a balloon over the top of the bottle and get it full and tie it like so. <laughs> put some thin foil over the balloon itself and let it go. Okay. I was doing that doing that. This is really cool. <laughs> well, guess what? A little did I know that the Air Force was picking up all these blips in Vancouver, Canada. <laughs> on radar. On radar? Yeah. They were seeing them on radar. And a neighbor, yeah, they could see them on radar. And a neighbor then saw them as well and heard some of the news stories on the radio and then they called in the media. So... <laughs> When they're doing it the late afternoon, there was these people coming around with cameras. <laughs> he introduced me. Really? Yeah. So my dad was there and he, okay, he got permission and all this stuff and I was kind of excited and the, the newspaper people were taking notes and the camera people were filming, filming me. I actually got pictures of this. Okay. And, the old, and actually the old reports too. I'd love to have that video now. I mean, I'd laugh my head off. I, I know I would. <laughs> so I sort of like King, King whatever. On that day, the journalist took me up for lunch and blah, wow, big deal, you know, and all that. And the Air Force was all excited and worked their opinions and stuff. On um, about the balloons. <laughs> about the balloons, like that long ago, they were already writing about you. So a long time ago, when yeah. You, when you let these balloons go, you put foil over them and then you let them go? Yeah. And they would explode in the air? Oh, no, they would expand a little bit more, of course, but on a bright sunny day? They would just shine? I lived on kind of like a, uh, what they call North Vancouver, which is like on the side of a mountain. Okay. So it wasn't the explosion of the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. It was just the, the fact that you had the foil over it. It they was detecting. Yeah, and the city was not that far away. Right? Okay. And it's a big city. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. It was uh, talked about for a few weeks after that. And with my early spark gap transmitter, the media didn't cover that. They, well, actually they did. Was that the same time frame? You had them at the same time frame? Yeah, roughly that. They, they did mention the newspaper article, but when I fired the spark gap transmitter, the neighbors would get upset with me. What would, what would happen with the neighbors? TV sets. Go TV down. sets? Yeah. What was this Tesla device that you created? Spark gap in a coil? Mm. And a capacitor? 
Was it a standard Tesla coil or was it something you kind of? Yeah, not Tesla coil, it's an induction, more of an induction coil, heavy voltage induction coil. Okay, so it was more of a high amperage device. Yeah, very high amps. Okay. So Lit up the whole front yard at night, <laughs> so that's cool too. How big was this thing? About that big? Yeah, I used a bucket of salt water. Uh, so oh, as your capacitor? As a condenser. As your condenser, okay. Just a raw, simple circuit. Two curtain rods and carbon um, arcs out of a uh, ba old batteries. Okay. But it made a real impressive, like, light up the whole front yard doing this. So, so at that time, did, did, did you have to set this device up in a resonant situation to make it work? Or was it just condenser, coil, spark gap? Simple. Just plug it in the wall and away you go. Let it go. Yeah, <laughs> man, I got the idea from an old science book. Okay. And I had a lot of fun with that, and I started adding one more antennas to it until a helicopter would come flying over and start circling. And <laughs> I said, oh no, I'm kind of kidding. What did your dad think of that? He never really uh, thought much of it. He just, he just thought it was kind of fun. Funny. My mother thought it was funny too. Helicopters swarming your house. <laughs> They're just laughing at you. Yeah, my dad would take photographs of the journalists that they came in, but it was fun. So what did you do after that? You built this, you, you set off some hydrogen balloons, you, you, you had helicopters surrounding your house. <laughs> this yeah, Tesla. Well, this, yeah. What, well, well, let me ask you this, <laughs> this Tesla device, at that, at that time, did you know it was putting off? Some sort of a signal? I, going by my dad's encyclopedia, I knew if you built this, it'd send out radio waves. Okay. So that was a side effect of the, of the device. No, I really wanted to send out radio waves, and that really did cause a mess, but... Okay, so the intention was to send out the radio waves. Mm, that, yeah. That's why you built this device. But, the arc itself is really cool to play with. Yes. Just put your finger in there? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I did that. Arc with that long. <laughs> right. Carbon arc lamps. Yep. yep. Wow. Right. That's what they use in the old filming industry. It's carbon, yeah. arc, carbon arc lamp spotlights. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Probably the same, same simple setup. So, that was a little fraction in my life there, a little bit of adventure, I guess you'd say. <laughs> so, what'd you do after that? How old were you when you, this was still around your six Oh, well, actually I'm a late bloomer. My doctor would tell me that years ago, but uh, if I, I was 20 at the time. Okay. So I'd probably be eight years old, mentally, I guess. Yeah, okay. Don't know. Yeah, it's hard to explain. You can't go into that detail because really, mm -hmm. I'm the same way. I, I, I was classified as some random, you know, special this, special that, and it's like, no, nah, I think we're more advanced. I think that's what, they don't understand how to interpret us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't know how to interpret us, they don't know how to take us, so we're just into what we're doing. I think so, I mean, I listen to all the different kinds of gadgets over that, in that time frame. So, so you started, you started with this Tesla gap experiment, basically, mm -hmm. and then, you were sending out, you wanted to send out radio waves. So, what was the next step? What'd you, what, what's the next piece of equipment you got a hold of that you started messing with? Well, I kind of branched into different things. Uh, it was an audio amplifier, actually, that I got a hold of. Okay. And I had a riot hooking up to the telephone line because you could hear <laughs> people talking. And I broadcast it out in the street. <laughs> Although my parents didn't like that too much. I bet they didn't, uh, no, especially when it was their conversation. Yeah. A little record phone player thing and the amp was pretty good at it. Tube amplifier? Yeah. So at that time they had two, amp two amplifiers, nothing was solid state, right? No, not at that time. I think it's getting into tra well, yeah, transistors, but, uh, yeah, transistors. But I had fun with that for a short time. I could hear the party line talking. <laughs> I hear the party line talking and I turn up the volume like stereo set, you know, I hear people talking all, all around, you know. <laughs> and I then always had this mischievous streak in me. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta watch that balance for yourself. I think anybody's got that. <laughs> it's, mm. it's fun. Oh yeah, I, I then got into artillery and cannons, of course, very cool. Military cannons and... I have my own made. I threw up a diagram and... Really? 
took to my dad and I said, I need to get this done somehow. And he took me down to a machine shop with even more magical. Wow, look at this being turned out of brass. Okay, so that's when you got interested in machining? Oh, really? Yeah. I always had an interest in the machines. Like and that. machinery and stuff like that. Yeah. So my cannon got into trouble a few times. But... Did you shoot the cannon? Oh, yeah. Well, where did you shoot it at? The backyard. <laughs> in a subdivision? Yep. <laughs> Nobody can know they are <laughs> paranoid. They come running over thinking, oh my god, we thought the furnace blew up. <laughs> did, did you, what, kind, what size was this cannon? It one of the foot long. Uh, how big was the, mm -hmm. was the cannon ball? Three quarter inch. And you just packed it with... Uh, Make your own powder. Make your own powder? Yeah. And just pack it and shoot it in the backyard? Mm -hmm. Did you go through any houses? No, we had a forest in, in like uh, a ravine with a huge forest. So that covered oh, okay. that. <laughs> all of that problem, let's say. Then I had my gun collection with a 303 Ross rifle and a 12 gauge double barrel shotgun. And I fired those things off. Made a big bang too. So you're not interested in, in artillery? Guns and artillery. And, stuff. and then, and then, and then what? So you started to, what you do after that? I got into more radio gear and remember buying a transceiver that would fit into a taxi cab, let's say, a big thing like this, full tubes. Okay. Where'd you get it though? Bought it for 50 bucks. I was really excited about it. Fired it up and started talking to people. So where'd you get it? At a local store? This, this kind of stuff that in Vancouver is so many uh, industrial areas, scrap yards, secondhand stores. So you could go to the local scrap, st scrap yard and just... Right to Motorola Company. Really? Yeah, and they had a big plant down on Pemberton Avenue. And you could just pretty much... It's just funny. People were friendly. They opened the door, you know, I said, oh, they, here's somebody that likes our stuff or products, you know. <coughs> so they should. They would take me on a tour of their plant. And they would just let you have some equipment and bring home to play with? And ask them to shoot. Can I please have one of those? Or buy them? <laughs> no, they were very, very friendly that way, sure. So where did you, if you bought stuff, where did you get your funds from? Uh, money carried, well, I got some money from my dad. Okay, so he would help support you? Yes, and scrap meddling, I got a bit from that. Oh yeah, I do that. Yeah, <laughs> I do lot. that a lot. Oh yeah. You bring in your scrap, you get something You get something like a radio transmitter, and you're off to your next project. Oh, you're Find right. some more scrap, Yep. find the next piece you need. Oh, start scrapping at a very early age. <clears throat> my, dad, my dad brings me stuff. Since well, I moved to California, so he doesn't bring me stuff now, but he would pack my garage full of stuff. It'd take me more time to strip it down and separate it to get to the most value out of it. Just like, oh, and then he'd bring me something new, and by that time, I'll, it was just a weekly basis, but it's good. It's good that he did that. I had a lot of fun doing that. I got a lot of money, uh, and I had a friend, a buddy, that had a pickup truck, and we'd go scrap metal hunting. Drive around. And then we actually had an another friend of mine. We started our own company. It was short-lived, maybe three months. It was really hard work, but we uh, would make like sometimes several thousand in one night. And money, a note that really carried. That's yeah, it would last a while. <coughs> a lot of cash in the pocket off to the local um, surplus store. You could get how much? How much surplus could you get for a thousand dollars at that time? Oh, you get a van full of it. Really. And, and, and the good part is that I was getting more into Tesla stuff. Yeah. A lot of these companies didn't want any of the old stuff as well used to them. So it saved them the problem of getting rid of it, and I took it away. In some cases, just give it to me, like a, and deliver it like a two-ton transformer. I got for free. Really. For well, them to what get kind? Of, what kind of transformer was this? A hundred thousand volt. Um, Power station transformer. You got a, a hundred thousand volt power station transformer for free. Yeah. <laughs> Convoy electrical machinery. I got wow. three transformers from those guys. They deliver them. Where were you? Where were you at at that time? That they. Actually, where did you put them? Uh, going back in time, I got a four hundred thousand volt X-ray transformer. Chaos model electrical machinery and they're starting to pile into my basement. At your dad's house? Mm hmm At your dad's house? No, this is after I moved on to dad's place. Okay, place. Yeah. okay. I went through a lot of adventures. Okay. That are kind of interesting that I went through before I got on my own. Which means getting on my own things are getting weighty. So 
So you got these transformers in your basement. What'd you do with them? Put them, fire them off. <laughs> Did your neighbors complain about those? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I kind of jumped ahead through the 70s and all this a lot here because <sighs> I've been in other locations that were kind of unique that Oh, everybody knows, but I publish it on YouTube. Uh, as in, in that house. Okay. Essendale. Did what? Well, how, how did you get there? Somebody put you in there? No, I I decided to go there. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay, my mother went through the the LSD stuff at the CIA called Hollywood Hospital in the Westminster Bridge Columbia. Okay. A long time ago in the '60s. So, and then she went to review for Cruise Clinic. And I went there on an adult basis and got full run of the place. And I started even collecting equipment in there and I had a huge collection of radio gear in the... <laughs> and if I one flew over the cuckoo's nest, it's nothing compared to what I had to fun with. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have girlfriends. I was free to walk around in a new building. I had a collection of radio gear that I got from Port Cook Whitman in Canada and their own scrapyard all the way up and I had a gun collection in the hospital as well. You were set. You were I happy. Was, I had it under my bed. You so were in the right spot. I was in the right, I, yeah, I had freedom, girlfriends, uh, wild sex in the room, <laughs> back from the building. Unfortunately, I don't have any camera. I, I love it. <laughs> Never mind. I, I would have been able to take the entire adventure, but it's interesting to note on that note that the X Files filmed in my own neighborhood. Okay. They used those same buildings for most of their um, really shots. The same buildings you were in. Yeah, very same location. Because the X Files people were only a few blocks away. Okay. And I got to after I'm jumping ahead again. But That's okay. I got to meet a lot of the X Files people, Scully's um, uh, stunt double. Mm-hmm. We became good friends. Okay. And. So a lot of the producers I met as well. Shirley uh, Ingram, hi. Nice seeing you again in 2008. <laughs> met her first with MacGyver. MacGyver? Yeah, she borrowed, well, a well. You borrowed a couple of my cannons, remember? <laughs> I still got the receipt of my pile of papers here. And we met uh, in my one of the big labs, and then just uh, recently, 2008. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back. So what happens? So okay. So you got. Well, how did you get out of out of the uh, institute that you put yourself in? Uh, well, the doctor. Transition. I seen a lot of things there, and yeah. some pretty disturbing, and some I reported to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police because some of the staff did murder patients. However, um. I was just kind of hanging around, I go exploring the tunnels, the different buildings. Had a lot of friends there, and then the doctor just said, you know, John, let's just put the guns in the dispensary, because they kind of upset the patients. Let me know, and also let me know if you ever get sick of staying here. Just come to me, I'll write you all the paperwork, and you're gone. Okay. So actually it was, um, I would say probably three months later. Okay, time to start to move on. This is getting old and boring, so I went to Dr. Slichter. He wrote out the papers, gave me money. I called up my dad to pick up the radio gear and I took it. And some that of you had there? Yeah. <laughs> I had a good stash of it. Yeah, you got yeah, you take radio with you. To make space in the dormitory, which you actually can see on the X Files. Okay. I used to push a bed a foot down, another bed a foot down. <laughs> Like line the stuff up. <laughs> you, you, had, you would slowly inch your beds, the other beds down to make space in your area. Yeah, and I had it on, on the windows. Uh, it was Ward A2, West Lawn Building, and got up to the windows and kind of um, looked that high up. So, you know, staff were very tolerant. I mean, <coughs> they were open for that. What, did you hook this stuff up while you were in there? Yeah. And play with it and transmit? Yeah. Well, what yeah. kind of transmitters would you hook up to this stuff? Well, luckily in this complex, there was an electronic shop. Really? Yeah. So you could go there and get... Well, what kind of receiver would you connect to this type of equipment? <sighs> or transmitter, I should say. Uh, you, you, you 
turn it on and then get a receiver and see how strong it would pick up. Okay. And then luckily I had an understanding. So as, because this place is so immense, it also had an electronic shop. You had to repair a lot of the TV sets and... Okay. So you, were you able to work in that shop? Yeah. And is that where you learned a lot of your self-taught knowledge? Yeah, that helped too. In there? Yeah. I was about to be a DJ on the audio visual. Yeah. They had a closed circuit uh, transmission station uh, that went into all the different buildings and went down to College Farm where the psychopaths live. So I was a DJ I had all these cool um, record players. I got a little previous training before that. And I'd line up the songs, you know, do this stuff, do broadcasts and announcements. All in the actual air? Yeah. On air? Oh, no, it's all closed circuit. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it's all closed circuit. It's not going into the. Gotcha. Air. Yeah. But that was fun, though. Yeah, I did that so, a couple of times per day, and I found one record that they didn't really like that was called They're Coming to Take Their Way. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They would love this. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. So you so you took this equipment with you. Uh huh. Where'd you go? What did you do after that? Well, my dad took um, this equipment out of the um, the other place and it's part of my guns. I got one six shooter with me because I was going into a very dark area of Vancouver called which is used in exiles as well called Vancouver East. Uh, very uh, called Skid Row. So I stayed there for two weeks. Anytime I went to take a shower or a bath, I'd take my six gun. <laughs> and what I'm doing during that time, I was searching for a place to live in North Vancouver, Glen Valley. Okay. And a uh, situation came up that had a place available for 35 months, basement suite. I confirmed that with the uh, landlord. So I packed up my guns and clothing and got in a black top cab, took it right over to North Van, which you go, have to go over the second Narrows Bridge, up the mountain a bit, made the deal, and there it was. And my mother helped me out how to cook stuff. It was a basement? <laughs> yeah, basement suite. So it was underground? Yeah, it was a, it was a big house and a basement. Okay, so you got the whole basement? Uh, part of it. Have a really nice, actually. So you brought all your equipment there. You drag those transformers around with you. You had your dad's house, or you uh, in your other well, house. No, see, I came light at that time. <laughs> Figured out, couldn't and carry it. Most of guns, I'd pack in a full of a lot of guns, which made <coughs> a lot of news too, by the way, during major court case. Hutchison versus the Queen. <laughs> it made media every week. For You're two. all sorts of in the media. Two years. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Unintentionally. It's very powerful. Though. Yeah. I'll get them on your side. Mm-hmm. So because the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, I invite them down to look over my machine gun collection. I said, if there's anything here illegal, let's do it before this bill passes. And he says, oh, I don't see it. That's all deactivated stuff. Okay. And I would like to reactivate this. Is that okay? And he said, well, you can. Okay. Everything's cool. 18 days later, they came down again and said, we'd like to take another look at your gun collection. Well, what was the one you activated? I didn't activate it. I was asking them. But you could. Could I activate this? And what procedure? Leave the procedure. Oh, okay. And they said yes? Yeah. Okay. It's like a kid coming to a um, police station on the cap gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. It doesn't do anything. So anyway. Um, <laughs> so 18 days later, they came down. I had a flu at the time. They came in, Sergeant Bateman and crime lab people were searching over stuff and the cops said, well, you know, you got the flu, you should wait in the police car and then, yeah, I need to get some aspirin, so I went up to get some aspirin and the cops then said, well, maybe you should go to the police station and take them longer than So I'm there, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Sick as a dog. It's strange, this is weird, you know. Um, I don't really don't get in trouble with the local constabulary over anything, so <clears throat> I'm waiting there and then waiting there and the constable came in and said, Well, we're gonna have to lock you up. We found a real live machine down there. I'm thinking, huh? No, I was really sick. So, 
okay, what now what? You know, so I'm going to this jail. First time in a jail for eight hours. With a nasty cold. Oh. And very insulting when I was getting a drink of water. The tap would hammer like a machine gun. I said, God, who's playing this joke? <laughs> <laughs> and the police would come in and ask me a question, well, what did you do with that? Where'd you get these? Because um, Parliament was passing a new bill on gun control. And I had a test case. Hmm. So did I actually... Oh, I said, jailer! Jailer! <laughs> and I also call him. <laughs> he comes over and he says, you got more Kleenex or something like that? Blowing my nose, lay down. Ugh, this is like some kind of weird adventure I'm on. <laughs> so the um, cops come in again and said, "We're going to let you go, John. You just have to sign this promise to appear in court." Huh? Your your landlord's son is here to pick you up. And so I go and sign this paper. Mark Murphy's there, picks me up, come back to my place, the big mess. It's getting late at night. So... <clears throat> Did it mess your place up? Oh yeah. Just tore it up? Oh yeah. Did they take stuff? Oh yeah, they took a truckload of machine guns and stuff. But did they leave stuff? Even a cannon. Some, yeah, those were all hands. A hand cannon? Part. Yeah. Why'd they take a cannon for it? Mental. So this is interesting because... <clears throat> I said something's wrong here. I've got to go phone somebody at one of the gun collector places. Tom Bongellis, who said, what? You know, I just couldn't believe it. You phoned this lawyer right away. He said, what, too? And something went into me, this, like, kicking the second stage energy thing and started phoning yeah, all the media I could find. And they came down full board the next day. Got all the gun collectors of Canada because they were reporting it. <clears throat> so you, 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 you always use the media as a way to get your your information out there, yeah. whatever the case may be. In this case, gun yep. issues of kinds. Full steam ahead. Damn the torpedo. But anyway, <laughs> so my lawyer was really uptight over the thing, and we brought in another lawyer, Machine Gun Martinoff, who carried an AR-15 around with him, with his briefcase, <laughs> daring the cops to make trouble for him so he could sue them. And he did that often. He made a lot of news, too. So this press was reaching out to the other gun collectors in Canada and the United States. They set up a defense fund. And the media was really reporting this. And the politicians were slowly getting involved right after the Prime Minister of Canada, who was on my side. So I had to go to trial once. One day hearing, and the judge just says, I don't understand reporters, I don't understand gun collectors. <laughs> Threw his hands up in the air and it says, go to trial. Okay, trial by magistrate as they call it in Canada. Judge Cronin, I still have the reasons for judgment and all that court stuff and papers up. And seven day trial. That's kind of funny, folks, because the media thought it was funny too, because the evidence room, they have, would have to bring in these machine guns. The ones that they said that you had. That could be reactivated. So. You see this table lining up with heavy 50 cal running machine guns. I said to my lawyer, I said, I don't think that table's going to hold. <laughs> it did hold for some reason. I don't know why, but... <laughs> so they went over stuff. My lawyer went over stuff. My lawyer was so wired up and excited. He said, you know how many things are breaking through in precedence? He's sitting on the courtroom, like on the window. On the window. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Because the, the crime lab people, all their testimony was in our favor as well. So, so what happened? Uh, it's quite interesting. The judge uh, <coughs> really got angry. He slammed his gavel down and said, "All I see are entrapment going against John Hutchison." And he went on and on and on about it. He just said, "I order everything in return." I, you know, he's really tipped off. So, Slim and I just, yeah, you know, kind of. And they were going to try and use the, the hospital thing too. Uh, just Against like, you? Yeah. And I said to Slim, oh, that's just really cool. You know, once Slim, I have the original receipts when I have the gun collection there. You're kidding? You're kidding? <laughs> it was a, he was so excited. My doctor was there, my physician. 
You gotta be kidding, no, Flynn, here it is. <laughs> it's just too incredible. So but they never brought that up. If they did, we would said, did you were you aware that Mr. Anderson had a gun collection in the hospital? That would have just made. And I really wish that came I wanted yeah. it to come up in the worst way. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right, so. The cop that was involved in all this, he got fired. Good. Yeah. Nowadays, the more of that should happen. Who wouldn't have any cops? <laughs> and provincial ombudsman got involved as well, and we're going after the suing them. That the cop just vanished. And then so, I moved into my Tesla era. So then, so then after that, you moved, did, that, did that event motivate you to do something a little different? You still got all your gun collections, you still do your gun stuff, you love it. So, you yeah. started getting involved in Tesla. Yeah. But what, when, when you mentioned Tesla, did you know about Tesla at the time? I don't know. you were doing this research? Like, you know, where did you start? Like, I after that, what happened after that? Tesla I would read about in my dad's encyclopedias. Oh, really? My dad was branch manager for Western North America and <laughs> Calgary Encyclopedias, so I would in the summer, I like laying in the sun and for something to do. I'd read an encyclopedia, pick on um, which one I it app or age or something, whatever. So I, I would read up stuff, cross search stuff, and I came across Tesla. And reading about him it stuck in my mind, like, er, like back when I was young, and then later on, uh, I heard about Tesla coils, and I thought I should build one of those things. Definitely. So I did, and I built other ones, and then... What, what kind did you start with? Uh, what's, what's the first Tesla ball you built? Explain it to me. It's, uh, it was about six feet high. <laughs> That's a big one for the first one. Yeah, four inches in outside diameter. It's kind of extra capacity on it, I guess, but... I was inspired to build it, and I did. And did it to the old 18th century standards of wire and cable and how to mount the stuff. And because it's Vancouver, again, Vancouver seems to have such an endless amount of scrapyards with vintage stuff in them. I'd actually find the vintage cable. The vintage wire with just the insulation wrapped around it? Yeah. Is that what you use? I mean, what did you use for your primary? Copper pipe? Or did you have, find some wire that had insulation on it too? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, for the primary, I used uh, copper pipe. Okay. Couldn't find any, any some stuff I'd find a small amount of it, but yeah. the wire was uh, pretty cool to find that score but at North Star Salvage again. 1170 pal. So I proceeded to build one, proceeded to get a, um, I had a, a static source, Windhurst generator, and then I got a Van de Graaff generator, and then, then I started getting in more stuff like transformers and things. Were you, were you playing around with this stuff in hopes to do transmission again? I was interested in this watching the spark uh, displays in the dark room. So what, what did you, what did you see in the spark when you were looking at this stuff? Just the unusual shapes they take. Oh, the actual spark itself? Yeah, yeah. So you could, would you look at the spark and, and, cause that hurt your eyes, wouldn't it? Not to be, <laughs> no, no, no. In a darkened room, they're quite unusual. The electrostatic ones are kind of funny looking things like cauliflower shaped sparks. And it wouldn't jump the spark out, it just burst out. It would just burst out and wouldn't hit that gap. Yeah, but that's interesting. The, vi the, vi uh, the Windhurst generator ones? Yeah. They wouldn't jump the gap. No, I, that's what I was using at the time, and the Van de Graaff came later. Oh, okay. And then a huge one came like after that, but I would do this and, um... <clears throat> what, what's, well, I gotta ask you a question. So I tried to build a Van de Graaff generator. Yeah. What's the material that you like to use on those? What was the most beneficial material for the belts and the rollers? Ah, uh, yeah, that's gonna be a lot of uh, Bakelite. Bakelite? Good old Bakelite. As a roller? Yeah. yeah. Both rollers? Yeah, I'd use that. And then what would you use at the belt? Uh, ordinary rubber. Just regular rubber? Mm -hmm. Black? Yeah, I was using black. You using black? Yeah. Depending on it, if it's got oil in it, not oil. So many little variables like oil and... Yeah, I had some problems with oil. <laughs> it's just, uh... <laughs> Killed it. Yeah. <laughs> oil, uh, oily environment, too. Yeah. Alright, so you, you were playing with Tesla coils and, and high voltage stuff and... 
Then you started getting into radio? Uh, yeah, I was into radio quite a bit. Okay, so... I never had a hand license, but I was into listening or broadcasting weird stuff. Up. You were broadcasting weird stuff? Yeah, but I used a dummy loader. Okay. So I wouldn't break any DOT, like you had FCC uh -huh. here, you have DOC. Okay, so, so basically it would, it would still transmit locally, because you've got the signals run through the wires and all the signals are there, but the dummy loader would just keep it local. Keep it down, yeah. You know, I mean, that could fire up. Uh, yeah, they're used for uh, yeah. testing. But, yeah. So. Okay, so you've got all, you, you, you're doing Tesla? Bathroom. Bathroom break. Bathroom break. Sounds good. Right back. Cool. Too much coffee and tea, but I'll be right back. <laughs> I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs>